Book 1, chapters 31 through 35 of Against Juvenianius by St. Jerome. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Then follows, A garden shut up is my sister, my bride. A garden shut up, a fountain sealed. That which is shut up and sealed reminds us of the mother of our Lord, who was a mother and a virgin. Hence it was that no one before or after our Savior was laid in his new tomb, hewn in the solid rock. And yet she that was ever a virgin is the mother of many virgins. For next we read, Thy shoots are an orchard of pomegranates with precious fruits. By pomegranates and fruits is signified the blending of all virtues in virginity. My beloved is white and ruddy, white in virginity, ruddy in martyrdom, because he is white and ruddy. Therefore, it is immediately added, his mouth is most sweet. Yea, he is altogether lovely. The virgin bridegroom, having been praised by the virgin bride, in turn praises the virgin bride, and says to her, How beautiful are thy feet in sandals, O daughter of Abinadad, which is, being interpreted, a people that offer itself willingly. For virginity is voluntary, and therefore the steps of the church in the beauty of chastity are praised. This is not the time for me, like a commander to explain all the mysteries of virginity from the Song of Songs. I have no doubt that the fastidious reader will turn up his nose at what has already been said. Isaiah tells of the mystery of our faith and hope. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. I know that the Jews are accustomed to meet us with the objection that in Hebrew word Alma does not mean a virgin, but a young woman. And to speak truth, a virgin is properly called Bethula, but a young woman or girl is not Alma, but Nahara. What then is the meaning of Alma? A hidden virgin, that is, not merely a virgin, but a virgin and something more, because not every virgin is hidden, shut off from the occasional sight of men. Then again, Rebecca, on account of her extreme purity, and because she was a type of the church which is represented in her own virginity, is described in Genesis as Alma, not Bethula, as may clearly be proved from the words of Abraham's servant, spoken by him in Mesopotamia. And he said, O Lord, the God of my master Abraham, if now thou do prosper my way which I go, behold, I stand by the fountain of water, and let it come to pass that the maiden which cometh forth to draw, to whom I shall say, Give me, I pray thee, a little water of this pitcher to drink. And she shall say to me, Both drink thou, and I will draw for thy camels. Let the same woman be the woman whom the Lord hath appointed for my master's son. Where he speaks of the maiden coming forth to draw water. The Hebrew word is Alma, that is, a virgin secluded and guarded, by her parents with extreme care. Or, if this be not so, let them at least show me where the word is applied to married women as well, and I will confess my ignorance. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. If virginity not be preferred to marriage, why did the Holy Spirit choose a married woman or a widow? For at the time of Anna, the daughter of Thaniel, of the tribe of Asher, was alive, distinguished for purity, and always free to devote herself to prayers and fasting in the temple of God. If the life and good works and fasting without virginity can merit the advent of the Holy Spirit, she might well have been the mother of our Lord. Let us hasten to the rest. The virgin daughter of Zion hath despised thee, and laughed thee to scorn. To her whom he called daughter, the prophet also gave the title virgin, for fear that if he spoke only of a daughter, it might be supposed that she was married. This is the virgin daughter whom elsewhere he thus addresses. Sing, O barren, thou that dost not bear, break forth into singing, and cry aloud, thou that didst not travail with child, for more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife, saith the Lord. This is she of whom God by the mouth of Jeremiah speaks, saying, Can a maid forget her ornaments, or a bride her attire? Concerning her, we read of a great miracle in the same prophecy, that a woman should compass a man, and that the father of all things should be granted in a virgin's womb. Granted, says Jovinianius, 
that there is a difference between marriage and virginity. What have you to say to this? Suppose a virgin and a widow were baptized and continued as they were. What difference will there be between them? What we have already said concerning Peter and John, Anna and Mary, may be of service here. For if there is no difference between a virgin and a widow, both being baptized, because baptism makes a new man, upon the same principle, harlots and prostitutes, if they are baptized, will be equal to virgins. If previous marriage is no prejudice to a baptized widow, the past pleasures and the exposures of their bodies to public lust are no detriment in the case of harlots. Once they have approached the laver, they will gain the rewards of virginity. It is one thing to unite with God a pure mind and free from any stain of memory, another to remember the foul and forced embraces of a man, and in recollection to act a part which you do not in person. Jeremiah, who was sanctified in the womb and was known in his mother's belly, enjoyed the high privilege because he was predestined to the blessing of virginity. And when all were captured, and even the vessels of the temple were plundered by the king of Babylon, he alone was liberated by the enemy, knew not the insults of captivity, and was supported by the conquerors. And Nebuchadnezzar, though he gave Nebuzaradan no charge concerning the Holy of Holies, did give him charge concerning Jeremiah. For that is the true temple of God, and that is the Holy of Holies, which is consecrated to the Lord by pure virginity. On the other hand, Ezekiel, who was kept captive in Babylon, who saw the storm approaching from the north and the whirlwind sweeping all before it, says, My wife died in the evening, and I did in the morning as I was commanded. For the Lord had previously told him that in that day he should no longer open his mouth and speak, and no longer keep silence. Mark well that while his wife was living, he was not at liberty to admonish the people. His wife died, the bond of wedlock was broken, and without the least hesitation, he constantly devoted himself to the prophetic office. For he who is called being free is truly the Lord's bondservant. I do not deny the blessedness of widows who remain such after their baptism, nor do I disparage those wives who maintain their chastity in wedlock. But as they attain a greater reward with God than married women who pay the marriage due, let widows themselves be content to give the preference to virginity. For if a chastity which comes too late, when the glow of bodily pleasure is no longer felt, makes them feel superior to married women, why should they not acknowledge themselves inferior to perpetual virginity? All that goes for nothing, says Jovinianius, because even bishops, priests, and deacons, husbands of one wife and having children, were appointed by the apostle. Just as the apostle says, he has no commandment respecting virgins, and yet gives his advice as one who has obtained mercy from the Lord, and is anxious throughout the whole discussion to give virginity the preference over marriage, and advises what he does not venture to command, lest he seem to lay a snare and to put a heavier burden upon man's nature than it can bear. So also in establishing the constitution of the church, inasmuch as the elements of the early church were drawn from Gentiles, he made rules for fresh believers somewhat lighter, that they may not in alarm shrink from keeping them. Then again the apostles and the elders wrote letters from Jerusalem, that no heavier burden should be laid on Gentile believers than that they should keep themselves from idolatry and fornication and from things strangled, as though they were providing for infant children. They gave them milk to drink, not solid food, nor did they lay down rules for continence, nor hint at virginity, nor urge to fasting, nor repeat the directions given in the gospel to apostles, not to have two tunics, nor scrip, nor money in their girdles, nor staff in their hand, nor shoes on their feet, and they certainly did not bid them, if they wished, to be perfect, go and sell all that they had and give to the poor, and come follow me. For if the young man who boasted of having done all that the law enjoins, when he heard this went away sorrowful, because he had great possessions, and the Pharisees derided an utterance such as this from our Lord's lips, how much more would the vast multitudes of Gentiles, whose highest virtue consisted in not plundering another's goods, 
have repudiated the obligation of perpetual chastity and continence. When they were told in the letter to keep themselves from idols and from fornication, seeing that fornication was heard of among them, and such fornication as was not even among the Gentiles, but the very choice of a bishop makes for me. For he does not say, let a bishop be chosen who marries one wife and begets children, but who marries one wife and has children in subjection and well-disciplined. You surely admit that he is no bishop who during his episcopate bears children. The reverse is the case, for he will be discovered. He will not be bound by the ordinary obligations of a husband, but will be condemned as an adulterer. Either permit priests to perform the work of marriage with the result that virginity and marriage are on par, or if it is unlawful for priests to touch their wives, they are so far holy that they imitate virgin chastity. But something more follows. A layman or any believer cannot pray unless he abstains from sexual intercourse. Now a priest must always offer sacrifices for the people. He must therefore always pray. And if he must always pray, he must always be released from the duties of marriage. For even under the old law, they who used to offer sacrifices for the people not only remained in their houses, but purified themselves for the occasion by separating from their wives. Nor would they drink wine or strong drink, which are wont to stimulate lust. That married men are elected to the priesthood, I do not deny. The number of virgins is not so great as that of the priests required. Does it follow that because all the strongest men are chosen for the army, weaker men should not be taken as well? All cannot be strong. If an army were constituted of strength only, and the numbers went out for nothing, the feebler men might be rejected. As it is, men of second or third rank strength are chosen, that the army may have its full numerical complement. How is it, then, you will say, that frequently at the ordination of priests a virgin is passed over and a married man taken, perhaps because he lacks other qualifications in keeping with virginity, or it may be that he is thought a virgin and is not, or there may be a stigma on his virginity, or at all events virginity itself makes him proud, and while he plumes himself on mere bodily chastity, he neglects other virtues, he does not cherish the poor, he is too fond of money, it sometimes happens that a man has a gloomy visage, a frowning brow, a walk as though he were in a solemn procession, and so offends the people, who, because they have no fault to find with his life, hate his mere dress and gait. Many are chosen not out of affection for themselves, but out of hatred for another. In most cases, the election is won by mere simplicity, while the shrewdness and discretion of another candidate elicit opposition as though they were evils. Sometimes the judgment of the commoner people is at fault, and in testing the qualities of the priesthood, the individual inclines to his own character, with the result that he looks not so much for a good candidate as for one like himself. Not unfrequently it happens that married men who form the larger portion of the people in approving married candidates seem to approve themselves, and it does not occur to them that the mere fact that they prefer a married person to a virgin is evidence of their inferiority to virgins. What I am going to say will perhaps offend many, yet I will say it. And good men will not be angry with me, because they will not feel the sting of conscience. Sometimes it is the fault of the bishops, who choose into the ranks of the clergy, not the best, but the cleverest men, and think the more simple as well as the innocent ones incapable or as though they were distributing the office of an earthly service, they give posts to their kindred and relations, and they listen to all the dictates of wealth. And worse than all, they give promotion to the clergy who besmear them with flattery. To take the other view, if the apostle's meaning be that marriage is necessary in a bishop, the apostle himself ought not to have been a bishop, for he said, Yet I would that all men were even as I myself and John will be thought unworthy of this rank in all the virgins in the continent, the fairest gems that give grace and ornament to the church. Bishop, priest, and deacon are not honorable distinctions, but names of offices. And we do not read, If a man seeketh the office of a bishop, he desireth a good degree, but he desireth a good work, because by being placed in the higher order 
an opportunity is afforded him, if he choose to avail himself of it, for the practice of virtue. The bishop, then, must be without reproach, so that he is the slave of no vice, the husband of one wife, that is, in the past, not in the present, sober, or better, as it is in the Greek, vigilant, that is, nephalero, chaste, for that is the meaning of sophronoa, distinguished, both by chastity and conduct, hospitable so that he imitates Abraham in with strangers, nay, rather, in strangers entertains Christ, apt to teach, for it profits nothing to enjoy the consciousness of virtue unless a man be able to instruct the people entrusted to him, so that he can exhort in doctrine and refute the gainsayers. Not a drunkard, for he who is constantly in the holy of holies and offers sacrifices will not drink wine and strong drink unless the wine is a luxury. If a bishop drink at all, let it be in such a way that no one will know whether he has drunk or not. No striker, that is, a striker of men's consciousnesses. For the apostle is not pointing out what a boxer, but a pontiff, ought not to do. He directly teaches what he ought to do, but gentle, not contentious, no lover of money, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all chastity. See what chastity is required in a bishop. If his child be unchaste, he himself cannot be a bishop, and he offends God in the same way as did Eli the priest, who had indeed rebuked his sons, but because he had not put away the offenders, fell backwards, and died before the lamp of God went out. Women in like manner must be chaste, and so on. In every grade and in both sexes, chastity has the chief place. You see then that the blessedness of a bishop priests, or deacon, does not lie in the fact that they are bishops, priests, or deacons, but in their having the virtues which their names and offices imply. Otherwise, if a deacon be holier than his bishop, his lower grade will not give him a worse standing with Christ. If it were so, Stephen the deacon, the first to wear the martyr's crown, would be less in the kingdom of heaven than many bishops, and then Timothy and Titus, whom I venture to make neither inferior nor yet superior to him. Just as in the legions of the army there are generals, tribunes, centurions, javelmen, and light-armed troops, common soldiers, and companies, but once the battle begins, all distinctions of rank are dropped, and the one thing looked for is valor. So, too, in this camp and in this battle, in which we contend against devils, not names but deeds are needed, and under the true commander, Christ, not the man who has the highest title has the greatest fame, but he who is the bravest warrior. End of chapters 31 through 35, book 1.